uh, I'm back for the, the next session. And this session is looking at what's happening in the IoT sphere globally and what's happening in particular regions. I think what we found out from the IoT survey, you know, we looked at nine different geographic markets and they give us a, a good idea of what's going on in those markets. But of course, one market doesn't represent a region. So I'm delighted to have a, a panel of experts in particular regions to join me today to explore some of the issues around what's happening in, in the different regions uh, globally. So we'll be exploring those. And I'd first of all like to welcome the panel. So uh, first of all, uh, we have Nasia Skulikariti from Apiro Data. Hello, Nasia. Hello, everyone. How are you, Andrew? I'm very well, thank you. And you're looking well yourself. So, thank you, uh, thank you. If you could just give us a brief introduction to yourself and your company, your, your CEO, founder of Apiro Data. Great, yes. Um, as I said, uh, my name is Nasia Skulikariti. Andrew mentioned that I am the founder and CEO of Apiro Data. Apiro Data is a modular end-to-end -end IoT solutions and platform company where we enable deployment uh, of uh, various solutions, ingestion of data, analytics. And our main aim, I would say, is that we're trying to enable telcos and organizations to create this IoT IoT solutions and services in an efficient and constructive way so they can go to market a bit faster. So we work with them from the beginning to the end to ensure that they get the solutions right all the way to the monetization. Thank you, Nasia. I'd now like to bring in David Hamblin, who's the CEO Asia Pacific of Pod Group, joining us rather late in the day for you, David. So if you could give us an Thank introduction you, to yourself and to Pod Group. Hi, Andrew. Hello, everybody. So um, I'm David Humbling, and I head up um, Pod Group's Asia Pacific office here in Hong Kong. So um, Pod Group, we're an enterprise network operator providing global connectivity. And um, we're located in many markets, but I'm here representing Asia and my knowledge of the Asian market and what we're seeing over here. So it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you, David. And last but not least, I'd like to welcome Dawood Galadi, who's CEO of, of Zariat. Hello, Dawood, if you could do the same, introduce yourself and t tell us what Zariat does. Hi, Andrew, thanks for that intro. Um, my name is Dawood Galini, I'm the CEO of Zariat. Uh, what we do is we provide uh, connectivity to enterprise um, our compelling proposition is effectively securing the uh, enterprises, ensuring that the signaling layer as well as the IP layer um, is secure. So there are a lot of threats that do exist um, for enterprise, um, you know, within the mobile network ecosystem. So if you have cellular IoT connectivity, you are exposed to those threats and uh, they can be denial of service and location tracking and, and data interception, et cetera. Um, so to bringing that into the fold is, is what Zariot's mission is. Thank you. And missing from our list of panelists is Nicolas Damour, who's the Director of Technology Partnerships and Development at Sierra Wireless. Uh, but before he went on holiday um, at five minutes to midnight, he recorded a video to give his perspective on what's happening globally and regionally uh, in, in IoT. And so we're going to take 10 minutes now and uh, listen to, to Nicola, and, and then I'll resume the discussion with our, our esteemed panelists. Hello, everyone. My name is Nicolas Damour and I'm a director for technology partnerships at Sierra Wireless. Today for the Mobile Ecosystem Forum, I would like to give you some perspective on the growth and opportunities of the Internet of Things, both from a global, but also from a regional perspective. So let me start by introducing you the Sierra Wireless company where I work. So Sierra Wireless, uh, we are an IoT pure player and we've been active in this space for more than 25 years. Now, what we are 
most well known for uh, is providing devices, especially cellular IoT devices, in the form of cellular chips, uh, also called cellular modules, that one can integrate in all sorts of different IoT devices, but also uh, to provide to the market cellular gateways, so mobile routers connected over the cellular networks. Now, all of these cellular devices, modules and gateways, are connected, as you can see in the middle of this slide, through connectivity networks, so cellular networks, which is, which is also a product that we provide to the market, and especially SIM cards, to provide connectivity on a global scale. On the right-hand side, uh, you can see also cloud solutions, which is also part of our portfolio, so that one can op operate remotely and orchestrate the data coming from all of these devices uh, deployed on the field. Now, from left to right, we provide the opportunity for the different industries out there to connect their field assets on the field uh, all the way through a very secure pipe going through device connectivity and cloud solutions all the way to the right hand side to their IT infrastructure. Now, having said that, um, Sierra Wireless is a company that is headquartered in Vancouver in Canada, but where I think we can have an interesting perspective for you today is that uh, we have a lot of people uh, operating from our Europe and Middle East Africa office in, in Paris, in Toulouse and in Sofia Antipolis, uh, where I am based actually in Toulouse, but also in the Asia Pacific region, um, in Taipei, Hong Kong, Melbourne, and a number of other cities. So that being said, operating in, in Americas, in Europe and in Asia Pacific, Hopefully, we can give you some interesting insights into the global and regional growth um, of the Internet of Things. Now, if we can take a step back for a second about the development um, of the cellular technologies, looking as far back as 1990, um, the 2G technology that was back then standardized by the GSM group and now has been taken over since the 3G by the 3G PK group uh, in the 2000s, then all the trend that we always had since then was uh, the trend of providing um, more efficient technologies, more efficient cellular mobile technologies that can deliver more throughput to have more speed, more bandwidth going all the way. So from GSM 2G to UMTS and CDMA, HSPA, um, 3G and then LTE uh, and then LTE Advanced uh, in 4G, LTE Advanced Pro. And when we reached the point of LTE Advanced, we could witness a split between the ongoing trend of pro providing speedier technologies, um, but at the same time, we also could see that there was a need and, and a split to provide uh, technologies uh, that were less power hungry but were more massively applicable. So this split really led now in the 5G generation in 2020s, when we are today, um, to a split between what is called the NR technology, so new radio for super broadband IoT, ultra reliable, very low latency. But on the other end of the spectrum, at the bottom, we have LTM and narrowband IoT. So these two technologies for the massive IoT that provide low power, super efficient and wide range cellular technologies for very different use cases. Now, going further, uh, if we look at where we stand today, so giving an outlook on the growth opportunities, we must say that now, well, um, uh, more than a year after the COVID-19 crisis um, struck the whole planet, uh, even more people are now convinced today of the need for IoT solutions, whereby you can operate, monitor, control uh, your assets, uh, industrial assets. You can talk to people as well. So all of that remotely. So um, uh, operate uh, simply your business and your, your operations on a day-to-day -day basis uh, using connected technologies. So it's a huge opportunity. Of course, 
uh, COVID-19 again has slowed down the economy globally uh, in a pretty significant uh, manner. But what we can see today is that a lot of the projects that uh, had been started before have continued. And now we can see a really, really strong uptake uh, for these projects uh, now in, in 2021. So the key drivers here uh, for all of these people deploying IoT solutions out there is that they want uh, an ecosystem that, that is rich of solutions, where they can actually choose freely choose your the, the providers um, the uh, providers of the devices of the cellular networks of the cloud solutions and they want this ecosystem to be very interoperable of course and part of that interoperability and, and global scalability is the ability for the cellular networks to roam so that you can use a sim card on different networks uh, radio networks everywhere in the world so fortunately, um, uh, what we can see is in terms of drivers and growth opportunities, these last generation 5G cellular networks uh, that I was talking about, so both 5G and R, so and, and 5G super broadband, I would say are starting to get deployed worldwide. As you can see on the slide here, in the bottom left and the bottom right corner in North America, in Europe, but also pretty much everywhere uh, in the world, in the uh, uh, industrially developed country or developing countries. But also at the same time, uh, you have so these low power wide area technologies I was talking about, so especially LTEM and narrowband IoT, also known as CAT M1 or uh, CAT NB1 and B2. Uh, as you can see on these maps here, they are also getting widely deployed everywhere and they're already available in a lot of countries. So this provides relief for a, a, a huge opportunity, again, for growth and deployment of those IoT solutions. The technology is there, the devices are there, the networks are there, and are being more and more densified and deployed so that everyone can now deploy, deploy those technologies. Now, looking on the next slide and, and asking the question about um, the customers. So. Uh, are we talking about global deployments or regional deployments? Uh, as I was saying, so what we can see at Sierra Wireless so are, are, are huge um, growth opportunities for projects in all regions, really. So North America, Europe, and EMEA, Asia Pacific. But a common factor among all of these customers are that most customers, they start their solutions locally. So if they're headquarters uh, somewhere in Canada or somewhere in Germany, somewhere in Spain, somewhere in Japan, in Australia, most of them will start locally. But what they really want to achieve is scale. So they want to be able to deploy on a global scale, at least on a very international scale. So um, continental scale, I would say. So what's very, very important uh, to provide to these customers in the market are solutions that can start local, but also scale globally. And so coming back to that picture I had shown uh, in the very first slide, um, all of the elements of the IoT chain from the devices to the connectivity to the cloud, they must be both local and global. So the devices, it means they, can, they should be able to support many, many different frequency bands and be deployed everywhere in the world. On the connectivity side, you need to have SIM cards that allow you to go everywhere in the world, either over roaming or over the embedded SIM technology, which will be discussed, uh, I guess, in, in the next session. Uh, and also the cloud technology. The cloud must be, um, must be global, uh, must be a little bit immaterial, if you will, but also they must take into account um, some, some concerns about security, some concerns about data residency sometimes in some particular countries. So you also must have cloud solutions that accommodate for both local and global deployments. So all in all, it was a very short presentation, but um, I'm already done. I hope uh, this was interesting and uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me at endemore at sierrawireless.com uh, if you want to hear a little bit more. Now, uh, I will uh, give the floor back to the moderator and uh, I will wish you a, a very present, a very pleasant day. Thank you very much. Bye bye.
So I'd like to thank uh, Nicola D'Amour uh, of Sierra Wireless for a very insightful overview of uh, what's going on globally. Um, but as I said earlier, um, we're, we're very interested in, in focusing on regions and on you know, maybe key markets where exciting things are happening. So the, the first question I've got to ask is, really what, what are growth rates looking like in your region? And uh, from, from this uh, particular question, we've got David who'll be talking about Asia Pacific. I think Dawood can give a kind of global overview and Nasia is particularly interested in what's going on in Africa. So I'm gonna to go to, to David first and uh, sort of see what's the growth rate like and are there any particular geographical markets in Asia Pacific that you're seeing as growing particularly rapidly? Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, so I think Asia Pacific always tops the leaderboard in growth rates for IoT. And certainly um, the prediction is that it's about 30% 30, uh, 30 compound annual growth rate uh, uh, between now and 2026. So we're definitely seeing that on our side as we see exactly what's coming to market. And these applications are getting a lot more innovative. Um, we, we're seeing a lot of growth in particular in China um, and through the OEMs with um, applications, like industrial applications, healthcare applications. And um, we're seeing that these that these OEMs within China are trying to break out and get to, especially to places where we also have local offices, the US and Europe. Uh, so all of these countries are looking to expand. So um, we're also seeing a lot of growth in the Southeast Asia, Thailand, Malaysia, and this is based all on um, government initiatives in those, region, in those regions as well. Thank you, David. Uh, I'll switch to Nasia now and ask you the same question of, uh, you know, what, what's happening in the geographical regions that you're particularly interested in? Sure. Um, well, when we're talking about uh, Africa, it's such a big continent that we can expect that there's variations from one end to the other. Looking at the sub-Saharan region, um, and looking at a little bit of the statistics, um, the IoT market has been growing mainly in key areas such as South Africa, Kenya, uh, Ghana, Nigeria, uh, the, even Seychelles. The reason for that is the concentration of the internet penetration, connectivity availability. Um, when it comes to Africa, they're lacking a little bit behind on the technology side of things and uh, connectivity overall can be a challenge, especially in the rural areas. So in terms of numbers, um, like last year in 2019, um, it was expected, or at least it is believed that uh, we reach about 1.8 US billions in revenue uh, for, for the sub-Saharan region. Now, in terms of growth, that growth is expected to go all the way to, I would say, 11 billion by the year 2030. And this is overall for the sub-Saharan region. Now, if we concentrate on the area that uh, is more active, and that's the South Africa area, um, and we look at uh, how <clears throat> the likes of such these statista are putting together the information we can expect in the next you know three to four years at least 40 percent increase in the overall penetration and usability of uh, various um uh, iot services now in especially in south africa the majority of uh, the solutions are um, traditional machine to machine or connectivity services they're very big in that area but um, we also see traction in uh, places such as you know uh, transportation logistics uh, manufacturing mining and then in areas especially agriculture when we're talking about africa agriculture is key in, in that region um, I would like to touch a little bit upon the challenges that we're facing also in, in Africa, and, and that's because of the size of the overall region. Um, some of the, you know, the challenges I mentioned, uh, connectivity 
is touch and go, especially in rural areas. Also, um, you know, the, the, the size, it's very hard to manage overall. Uh, technologically, the region is lagging behind. Internet penetration is also uh, quite low, but growing. And most importantly, the availability of knowledgeable, um, I would say, sources to allow companies to deploy the services uh, needs to grow in order for the IoT solutions to, um, you know, to reach the next level. Thank you, Nasia. I'm going to bring Dawood in, and it's the same question to you. And I, I know you've got more of a a kind of global perspective based on your company's activities, but I know you're interested in, in, in particular uh, regions and markets. So you know, what sort of growth rates are you seeing out there and where is it happening geographically at present? Yeah, I think it depends on what you talk about in terms of growth, like is it growth in data volumes or, you know, numbers of connections. Um, so if you look at like, you know, simply number of connections, we're probably talking more in terms of the emerging markets. If we're term, talking in terms of um, you know, actual data volumes, then we're talking about the more mature markets, you know, where they would have more data intensive kind of activities and where you know, the activities are more sophisticated. So uh, you know, in mature markets, we'd be talking about things such as business process re-engineering or business process improvement, et cetera. Whereas you know, in the emerging markets, we're talking about you know, devices that are simply providing the most basic connectivity you know, for things that to them would be effectively leapfrogging. So, um, you know, metering, uh, et cetera, you know, where there's millions and millions of devices being connected, but the amount of data consumption is just simply low at the moment, you know, and as those markets mature, they will get those more sophisticated, you know, business process re-engineering tasks uh, to hand as well as, you know, other uh, things such as, you know, car connectivity, et cetera. So that's kind of the main difference between um, kind of the developed markets and those that are just simply emerging at the moment. Thank you, Dawood. I'll, I'll stay with you. And, you know, you've already touched on the key drivers of growth. Uh, let's look at the other side of the coin and say, what are the challenges that you're seeing uh, in this market developing? Yeah, I suppose in terms of, you know, challenges, um, I suppose the most basic one, um, and it's one of the reasons why, you know, some of the estimates that, you know, have been out there uh, haven't kind of been met because, you know, we've seen huge numbers in terms of, you know, what the projections have been for the future, but they may not necessarily have been met. And we're a little bit behind the curve simply because of the nature of IoT. You know, it's something that is very new and it is, you know, relatively sophisticated. So, you know, a lot of projects need to start somewhere. Uh, I know Nicola said that, you know, the way that uh, projects roll out globally um, is that they would um, uh, they would start off in their local market before de being deployed internationally. So, you know, let's take the the local market as a deployment and you know, a POC kind of example, a lot of those, you know, would start and then they would stall based on, you know, kind of lack of expertise, um, you know, coming up with, you know, barriers that they may not have previously thought um, kind of existed and need to go back to the drawing board and fix those before they kind of start again. So that's kind of where the main uh, uh, growth is kind of, let's say, stymied. I mean, we will get there, but we need to kind of bypass, um, you know, th those hurdles, you know, and get beyond the kind of very much stop start nature of these very large scale global IoT deployments um, that exist. Thank you. I'll, I'll go to David and um, I'll ask the same question to you, David. Um, you know, you're in a region that's probably not very mm -hmm. homogeneous, lots of different country markets. Uh, what are you seeing as uh, like the key challenges that different types of markets are experiencing and, and what's sitting behind the growth in those markets? Is it simple IoT or more complex uh, or complex solutions? Oh, it's, it's also um, a very big continent. So it's, it's, there's quite a difference between one side of the continent and, and, and the other. But I'll, I'll actually agree with what Dawood says um, and mention knowledge. And I think one of the key challenges 
that we've seen in Asia is that there is there is a lack of know-how to some certain to a certain extent. There's a lot of money going into these projects, but it's difficult to actually get off the ground. People are people are trying to deploy very quickly, and then they hit the the common pitfalls, and things get delayed. Um, and they want to expand so quickly, they want to go global as quickly as they can. But there's then you have a lot to think about in different technologies around the world. You know, for example, LTE Cat M, which isn't available in some countries and it is in others. Some countries are using NBIoT. So what we're seeing very often is that we're, we're, we're getting projects coming in, but then really having to go in depth to find out how they want, to, how these customers want to implement them and how we can help to implement them across the world. So I think behind this growth, um, we're definitely seeing a lot of government initiatives over here, really, really pushing strong growth across the whole region. So for example, Malaysia has its 11th plan and within that, uh, smart city features very heavily. And then Thailand's got its digital agenda. So all of this public money is going into it, but also a lot of private investment. And the problem is sometimes when all this money goes in is then moving very quickly when there's such a huge, there's a huge amount of players in the markets and actually pinpointing what, what people need to do and how to go about it. Thanks, thanks David. I'll bring in Nasia there. And I know you touched briefly on some of the challenges in Africa, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm sure you've got more to say on that subject. <laughs> Well, um, the key one already being mentioned by both Dawood and David, which is the lack of qualified resources to see an IoT deployment um, successfully being uh, released into the market and uh, being able to you know, create this return on investment that every organization is looking for. Um, in, in, in the African region, is uh, is even more challenging, I would say, because um, the technology that we would expect to see in the, um, you know, in Europe, in the US, and in Asia is not there yet. However, I have faith that um, something similar uh, will happen with. Uh, what took place with uh, telecommunications, the continent can leapfrog and deploy technologies, you know, the re most recent technologies and take care of some of these uh, issues and challenges that they have seen. Uh, at the same time, the economic growth within the region is slow, which affects what is happening with any technological deployments in, in, in general, not um, IoT alone. So um, the know-how is key, uh, lagging behind in technology is very key. And the understanding that, you know, just putting sense on somewhere, it doesn't mean that you're gonna get the value out of, uh, of the system. Um, that's why we see that a lot of the organizations deploying uh, the services are concentrating on what they know best, um, which is the connectivity aspect. And most of them are being deployed by the operators, the telecom operators, themselves and the good thing is is that the individuals that the, the, the users the customers have faith to those operators because they've been around for a while another key thing for the region is local representation that i have seen is important either for an organization that is looking to deploy services in the region to create partnerships key partnerships with local uh, companies um, train them up to represent them and also uh, allow them to grow within the region. Thank you, Nasia. You, you, you made an interesting point, which is, is one I think Dawood uh, will probably want to comment on as well. And, and that's the point that it's uh, revolution, not evolution in, in quite a number of markets. And we're seeing a marked difference. So I don't know if you've got any supplementary comments, Dawood, on that issue. Well, I mean, when you talk about, you know, revolution versus evolution, you know, so for, from a, a mature market uh, perspective, it is simply incremental improvement. You know, we're not reinventing the wheel. We're just making things, you know, more efficient. You know, we're lowering costs. Um, you know, w when we talk about revolution, you know, we're really talking about, you know, the markets that, say, Nasia is talking about um, in Africa, where, you know, you have set-top boxes for TVs, you know, and people are only able to really consume that product, you know, uh, by paying for it on a, 
uh, usage basis uh, per day or per hour or whatever. You know, so being able to actually control those set top boxes, you know, remotely, um, that's you know, revolution. You know, wouldn't have uh, been able to happen kind of before IoT. So th that's a perfect example of where you know, in Africa, you know, you can take that and re revolutionize you know, an industry. Um, or even if you talk about something, you know, like say metering, um, you know, in, a, in, a, in an emerging market, you know, so, uh, you know, previously that wouldn't be something that, you know, would be easily deployed because the money wasn't in it in the same way as it would be in a, in a mature market, you know, but IoT can bring a cost uh, dimension that makes it now economical to do so. Um, so that, that's where we're talking about, you know, the, the, the reality of like, you know, uh, evolution versus revolution, you know, based on, you know, what geography you're in globally. All right, thank you. I'm, I'm going to go to, to David now and a slightly different question. Uh, we, we've had a kind of a range of traditional sectors, if we can call them traditional in a fast moving market, uh, that have, have been using IoT solutions. Um, so where do you see as kind of the next wave in terms of which sectors will offer opportunities in the next few years? Um, well, definitely. So I think as we've discussed before, the difference between the mature markets and the immature markets and or the emerging markets. And with that, I feel like here in Asia, we're seeing now a very big push towards digital transformation and improving business processes through IoT. So there's a very big push on industry 4.0, um, taking ownership, enterprises taking ownership of the network and deploying it for their exact needs. So in, in, industrial IoT is definitely growing very, very rapidly, uh, but also healthcare, and that's, this has come out of COVID as well. There are a lot of healthcare applications which are being launched around the world, and a lot of those are coming from China. They're coming from the OEMs in China. So it's, it's very interesting to see what's coming out of the COVID period and also where Asia is moving from the more basic applications such as telematics, moving into very advanced telematics with a kind of rich uh, selection of features, but also towards enterprises and what enterprises are doing with IoT. I think what's very interesting for us over here is just to see the, the sheer volume of applications and um, sheer volume of applications and the innovation of these applications, which are coming from small enterprises to governments to um, to to major international players and where they want to really expand it around the world. Yeah, I mean, that, that's certainly something that's coming out in the survey work we've been doing across a number of geographic markets, that the, the opportunity is not kind of restricted to the large end of the market anymore, which is where traditionally innovation use uh, usually starts. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go to, to Dawood now and ask uh, if you see any particular areas that are offering great opportunities or types of organizations that are, are deploying IoT, uh, probably more with a forward looking hat on. Um, well, well, at the moment, like you know, from a selfish point of view, you know, the, the thing that I like about, you know, the industry that we're in is that um, there's not a lot of joined up thinking, um, you know, so, so when you look at something like, you know, a car, um, the amount of connectivity that's in a car, you know, sometimes can be relatively outrageous, you know, you would think that you would only need one, um, you know, component that delivers connectivity for everything in the car, but at the end of the day, you know, someone wants it for telematics, you know, the other uh, component manufacturer wants it to, to, you know, perform their diagnostics. You want one uh, for, you know, delivering, you know, Wi-Fi to the car. You want one for the insurance company. You know, you want one for the SOS button. You know, so all of these things are kind of delivering, you know, a significant amount of kind of volume. And, you know, because a lot of people can't get it together and talk to each other, you know, it's delivering a, a lot of additional um, I suppose growth opportunities that maybe necessarily you know shouldn't be there, you know, if component manufacturers or um, you know people were kind of you know had a little bit more joined up thinking, you know. So if you look at something like utilities, um, you know, 
traditionally utilities you know were delivered uh into the household such as electricity water gas um you know so rather than having you know one mechanism for delivering uh all you know three you have each of them you know going and deploying you know their own unique solution three times into each household so all of that kind of duplication you know is causing a lot of you know wanted for us you know unnecessary duplication and increasing kind of our volumes and our potential kind of revenue streams um you know so so that that is you know a significant you know component but i think a lot of things as well you know are increasing in um in their use so for example like um uh, tracking tracking is you know become far more uh, than I would have ever thought, you know, everybody seems to want to track their asset, you know, and as those modem costs kind of come down in price significantly, as well as the connectivity cost, it makes it a lot more feasible. So it's driving, you know, the number of connect possibly connected items um, up significantly. And, and those are kind of a couple of examples where, you know, for different reasons, uh, we have those increases. Thanks. Uh, Nasia, do, do you have any points you'd, you'd like to make on uh, on that question? Um, just a couple. Um, I agree with everything that uh, both David and I would mention here, um, especially the track and trace. We see how significant that has become, um, especially after you know the past 18 months or so, uh, for various areas, not just the emerging markets, but you know the more mature market as well. When um, you know with the shipments and the logistics, by sending out the goods, the importance of being able to know where they are and how they've been distributed uh, so they can reach the right people at the right time, um, especially in emerging markets. And I'll concentrate a little bit on um, the sub-Saharan region. We saw in the past year or so how important it is to uh, track um, uh, medical goods to ensure that goods are not being lost in transit, to ensure that because of the vast distances that, um, that the shipments are, you know, crossing, that they're still good to be utilized, either that's medical or if that is, uh, you know, for, for food production. At the same time, an area that we see, um, and, and it's related to this, an area that we see traction is track and trace inside the warehouse environment. Um, I was talking to a company not too long ago that uh, they've estimated they were uh, uh, losing year on year close to 2 million USD dollars just for goods being lost or being misplaced or being left behind. All of these types of things can be taken care of by deploying IoT services. So, um, and, and let's not forget the whole, you know, um, uh, environmental angle on this and creating a more sustainable environment where IoT inherently can provide and help on all those areas. Thank you. I, I know we'll be exploring the theme of sustainability a little later on today. Um, we, we've not got long left and I've still got an ambitious list of questions for you, um, but I'm going to sort of change the flavor a little bit and I want to talk around technology issues uh, at, at the moment, and you know, going back to the survey we, we've just done, um, we were surprised by the amount of legacy technology that's still out there, so the amount of companies using 2G, 3G networks, even though these newer technologies are coming on, and, and almost the, the sort of reticence, uh, or um, should we say people aren't comfortable with vast technical innovation with, uh, with 5G, for example. So I'm, I'd just like to get your perspective on what's going on around technologies, uh, you know, particularly as well the mobile ecosystem forum around cellular-based technologies. So I'll come to uh, I'll come to Dalwood first on that, and you know, get, get your view on the kind of flavour of where you see technologies heading at present. Well, I mean, if you want to make everything sexy, you talk, you know, five G, and you know, people's ears kind of prick up. Um, I think from a basic reality point of view, we're really just so far off, you know, for a number of reasons. Um, if you simply look at it from a cost point of view, like most IoT initiatives 
are cost driven. You know, it's based on, you know, how can we re reduce the cost of something, make something more efficient, et cetera. So the fact that those, you know, 5G modems are very expensive, you know, makes it really uneconomical to pursue that. Um, you know, let's talk about connectivity and, you know, the fact that, you know, IoT devices are typically roaming. You know, we don't even have IoT roaming agreements kind of set up. Um, so let, that's kind of looking, you know, to the future and 5G. So as much as we talk about it, you know, we're still quite far off that, you know, point. Um, coming back to cost again, you know, making those IoT initiatives, you know, viable, you know, again, comes down to modem costs, connectivity costs. So how much data do you need? You know, people are trying to consume less than more. So can we get away with like 2G? You know, is 3G just enough? You know, the modem costs are cheap enough, you know, et cetera. You know, the 2G, you know, option might be relatively more stable or reliable, I suppose, depending on what region you're in, you know, and if you have that kind of connectivity. So I suppose, you know, looking forward into the future, you know, it does make me a little bit nervous because, you know, there's so much 2G and 3G that really needs to be supported, you know, for the next 10 or 15 years, you know, because people are writing contracts at the moment that are literally, you know, for the next 10 or 15 years, you know, based on 2 and 3G technologies. Um, so putting that into context, like 10 or 15 years, that's 2036. So, you know, <laughs> When, when networks talk about, oh, we're switching off our 3G, you know, at the end of the year, we've switched off our 2G already, you're kind of scratching your head, kind of going, you know, how is this going to work? How is this going to make the ecosystem, you know, sustainable? You know, are people who are deploying vast glo uh, national deployments of um, IoT infrastructure going to feel comfortable, you know, that this stuff is still going to work in 10 or 15 years time. So that goes back to that stop start component. You know, you go and deploy something, then realize that network decided they're going to turn off 3G at the end of the year or the end of 2022. You know, how are we going to rethink this? You know, okay, that's going to reintroduce uh, a cost because we need to put 4G chips in, into the modems now. Okay, where's where's the ROI now? Oh, okay, we're not going to get an ROI. Let's can the project or let's figure out something else. So, you know, all of those challenges are there. They exist and they're real. Um, you know, so I would hope that there's more of a rational, you know, sensible approach to you know all of this and um, you know just freeing up spectrum for for spectrum's sake and not you know realizing that they might be hindering one of the last remaining. Um, assets that the net mobile networks have to kind of sweat, um, you know, it, it just might not be there if, if they start switching off, you know, something like 3G, you know, quickly, unless they have some secret plan with Qualcomm to rapidly bring down the cost of those chips. Mm. Uh, but let's see where it goes. Um, I'm, I'm not going to predict it, but um, I, I do have some concerns. Thanks, Darwood. Uh, Nasia, uh, we, we've got three minutes left, so we're going to have to probably be uh, quite brief on the, the next question. Yeah, sure. Uh, so is it the you, same question? Or? Yeah. Uh, do, do you see this sort of coexistence of technology? Um, I think that uh, one area is where we see technology is a lot of organizations uh, that try to adopt new technology for the sake of adopting new technology. But as that would said very well, that is not necessary or needed for the majority of the IoT use cases, 2G and 3G is good enough. Where 5G comes into play um, is when you trying to uh, operate autonomous vehicles and you need that real key, real time uh, information and, and agility. So for, for the rest of the uh, use cases, um, there is no such thing as, and I keep saying that one size fits all, it has to be specific to what we're trying to achieve and availability of uh, the, the given technology in the regions that we're looking. So in some areas, um, you know, 
mobile connectivity is good enough and it should be used in you know 3g is deployed widely still in other areas rural areas it, it connectivity is sketchy so we need to look at other areas such as lora one or the different one technologies and as your survey showed earlier we still see, still see a lot of deployment of wi-fi and bluetooth and the reason for that is that iot deployments are within a building so you can still utilize this type of services. Thanks, Nasia. And I'll give the final word to, to David on your view on where, where it's all heading. Well, just on the on the last point, it is very splintered, not just in Asia, but across the world. So there's uh, for some people, there's no viable alternative to 2G for their applications. Because as LT Cat M is not is, is not I mean, for example, in Asia, you've got Japan that has all networks with LTE Cat M, and then China, which is mostly, which is NB-IoT, which is commercially available. So I think what we need to do globally is really, is really start moving towards one standard for IoT services, because at the moment, we're, we're nowhere near. And I think with the advent of the EU ICC and more deployment on the EU ICC and one SKU uh, put in at the OEM stage, that that way it is a little bit easier to switch and swap services. So that doesn't that doesn't help with the technologies. Um, and you've got LT bands, different LT bands in different countries, and I'm sure 5G is going to be just like that as well because of the lack of spectrum worldwide. So I'm interested to see where it's going, but I think one of the key key uh, things I take out from this is that actually we do need a really good uh, improvement for 2G for such a good uh, a real um, a replacement for 2G for um, all the IoT applications which don't need really advanced technologies of which there are many. Thank you David and so that was a, a real whistle stop tour I had quite a lot more questions that I wanted to ask but time is against us as usual on these sorts of uh, events. So I'd, I'd like to say a big thank you to Nasia, uh, to Darwood and to David for sharing their uh, insight on what's going on globally. And um, yeah, um, stay around for the, the next session. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, David. Thank you, Nasia. Bye. Thank you.